Hello everybody, this is Fernando for the latest Mafia and Gangsters video. Alright, let's go ahead and let's do another random entry here. This one taking an interesting turn of source because it actually focuses on a mafioso gangster that was featured here in Texas, specifically Galveston, Texas. In fact, it was so fascinating to read this information because I've been to Galveston in the past and I will also be there in the future and usually it's related to very ghost hunts but I had no idea that that location was actually at one point in time under the heavy influence of this powerful mafioso gangster it was just amazing to read this information and apparently to this day that town that city uh, still has some remembrances associated with him so with this information it was the first time I ever read about a Texas mafioso gangster of sorts and it has to do with this you're looking at him now his full name was Salvatore V. Maceo but as always he went by a nickname in this case Sam Maceo and then he had a moniker as well he became known as the Velvet Glove so let's go ahead and let's talk about all the interesting information associated with this gangster and how essentially he made Galveston into his city his own little mini empire there so who was this Sam Maceo well he was someone that was once again born in the prime city of Sicily, there in Sicily, Italy. Uh, again, a, a location widely known for having so many other uh, mafioso gangsters that moved over here to the United States. He was born on March uh, 1st, 1894. He had three other brothers. He was born to Vito Maceo and Angelina Sansone. Not much is known associated with his early, early life, let's say, with regards to his childhood, maybe going into his teens and young adult, but eventually he and his family immigrated to Louisiana back in 1901, and then cut to almost a decade later in 1910, that's when he ended up moving to Galveston, right before World War One, and then that's essentially where his tale began, at least his dealings with stuff associated on the illegitimate side there in Galveston. It was interesting too, because apparently his little empire or eventually was something that grew of course to be a big one all started from an origin that was quite small in this case at that time prohibition was almost in full gear going into 1920 in other words when that happened of course liquor beer wine any of that other stuff was considered illegal and so he began actually gifting wine to his friends and then other I guess customers and business associates and so on just almost, I got the impression innocently, but as it turned out, this was able to create him some lucrative stuff. It was almost like a no-brainer, right? You had so many other people in the mafia profiting quite heavily when it came to prohibition. Here he was falling into that same area just through a different avenue, in this case gifting these wines and then finding out that hey all of a sudden people are more interested in this liquor coming from him, how he is able to obtain it. And then how they in turn were able to get it from him. And so that's when he and I believe it was his brother and then one other person, a power broker there by the name of Ollie Quinn, who eventually got really serious about bootlegging there in the Galveston area. In fact, they opened up a speakeasy right then and there as well. And then that's where they were able to pretty much go from there. They were able to do some bootlegging and then eventually it grew into having legitimate items. This was the... Uh, interesting thing about this guy, Sam Maceo. He obviously did a lot of illegal activities. I mean, eventually his activities and a syndicate that he created that was called the Maceo Syndicate was involved not just in bootlegging, but also in illegal gambling, in prostitution, and then also numbers rackets. But on top of that, on top of those illegal activities, he was absolutely doing a whole bunch of other legitimate items, businesses, in other words, restaurants as well. Nightclubs was another popular thing. Diners was another thing that he invested in. All of these gains that he got on the illegitimate side, he was able to in turn profit from it and then associate with those on the more legitimate side. And that's where those businesses grew and he just became more and more influential.
influential. Part of his key was this. The reason why he was known as the Velvet Glove was because of his very, very smooth personality. Apparently, he was someone that was just an infinite, infinite charmer. Like he was someone that you could totally see him play the entire room. He had a smooth personality. He became the face of many of the other places that he frequented and owned there. It got him into a position where he was dealing not just with politicians, but with businessmen, uh, serious businessmen, and then also celebrities. And so with those styles and interpersonal skills apparently fashioned from that power broker that he learned from Ollie Quinn, who also became uh, his mentor at one point, besides being another associate, he was able to use all of this along with his almost Hollywood looks to essentially become the face of everything he operated in. And that in turn made him very popular with the customers and everyone he was dealing with. And that allowed those legitimate businesses to just grow and prosper. I got to admit, it does take talent when it comes to that. You can't just schmooze on your own. You can't just win over people as is. It takes tricks almost. It takes practice. It takes that innate, inert, I guess, charisma that can come out of someone. That's what this guy had. He was able to use his, uh, his dress, his style, his skills to essentially become that type of, of person that automatically just drew people in. And not only again on the on the illegal side, but also on the legal side, he was able to make practically anything become very, very powerful. At that point, eventually with all those businesses that he was able to create, he was also having politicians in his pocket. He was having the police force in there as well. He was also having uh, businesses that were both, um, you know, working for him and then inadvertently also working for him. Maybe in some cases they didn't know that they were being hired by the many, many businesses that he in turn was owning and controlling. That when that happened, they ended up becoming his associates almost. All of that eventually led the Maceo Syndicate to earn just millions and millions of dollars. He became very, very powerful almost in a quick, short time period. Part of what helped too was the fact that so many of those illegal activities, such as the gambling and the casinos and then the numbers racking and so on, this was before Las Vegas came aboard, before Las Vegas became the Mecca associated with those type of activities more on that here in a minute but when it was he was there in Galveston and when he was making this so popular there it earned its own little moniker with regards to that location um, eventually at certain points it was known as the free state of Galveston and that's where during that specific time period I think even up to the late 40s or so that's where that location became the hot spot within Texas if you were a prominent celebrity, if you were someone that was a prominent politician or maybe a businessman, then you were there in that location. All these vices available to you, all thanks again to San Maceo. And he in turn was getting his own little cut associated with it and then making some good, powerful friends and then enjoying all these wonderful things that he was presenting to his friends and so on. All of it, again, involving ventures entertainment clubs and so on so that was really really interesting to read all this because i had no idea that galveston had this type of of influence like they let it had a mafioso gangster a powerful one who slowly rose and then very quickly it was almost like like all of a sudden, it was like a mass consumption. He was suddenly the person there. I had no idea that Galveston had this type of error within it. Fascinating stuff. Whenever you read all this history, I'm going to definitely think that the next time I go there again on one of my ghost hunts and realize Hey, at this, at certain points in this town, this guy, San Maceo, controlled so many portions of that location. And it continued to be very, very successful with Galveston becoming the center of culture and economy. It just grew from there. And he decided to try to go out into other places as well. There were some hiccups here and there when it came to um, the, uh, the police and the FBI and so on. Those that he was able to purchase and then buy from and then and others like influence and then bribe. I mean, those were controlled. But in some cases, 
federal charges were still charged. For example, in 1937, such charges were rallied against him because he was accused of being the mastermind of a nationwide narcotics trafficking scheme. And apparently this was coming from New York. And so when that occurred, he was able to be released on bail. And then finally, a couple of years later, he was acquitted. But it goes to show that in this case, this was uh, one area that he was still having to fight. That obviously, because of the all the illegal activity he was doing as part of the Maceo syndicate and the control he had over there. But he used his powerful lobbies and then, of course, lawyers to be able to get out of it. His clubs were also raided here and there. Remember, this was the time of prohibition. So every now and then the club would have something as far as police raids. Uh, but as it turns out, there was very, very little success rates associated with it. Even though the clubs were raided numerous times, they were rarely successful when it came to having things done. In fact, there was one of his most popular ones was the Hollywood Diner Club. And it was raided multiple times. But as it turns out, it looks like nothing ever stopped stuck associated with it. He was also a very, um, there was another prominent location there in Galveston that was known as the Balinese Room. Once the other club closed down, then the Balinese Room became the go-to location there in Galveston. So if you wanted again to be at that place, the it place, in other words, in Galveston, which no doubt was a hot spot also in the whole state of Texas, that became the room that you wanted to go to, the area known as the Balinese Room. And so this guy continued with this stuff, and eventually he was able to also gain a very, very popular perception with the public. A lot of it helped with his apparent genuine like for the community, like he actually cared for the community around them. It was rewarding him immensely, not just from the business, not just with the customers, uh, but also with everything else like the politicians and the business leaders and all the celebrities I mentioned uh, a while back. So in this case, he wanted to give back. As it turns out, many of his businesses needed work done. And so what he would do was he would hire mostly local companies. Instead of bringing in, let's say, cheaper work from elsewhere, and to try to save a buck, the impression I got was that this guy, San Maceo, would focus more on local companies because that gave the perception that he was giving back. He was hiring contractors from local companies. They, in turn, were profiting from the pay he was giving. And then, of course, it all helped him out at the end because they would, in turn, frequent his locations, and that would help out, too. He also was a heavy, heavy donor, not just to his church, but also to local charities that stood out with a lot of news articles. There was even some more infamous stories as far as his generosity, again, all tying into the very popular public perception he had there. Apparently, there was a local dealership there that was just on the edge of bankruptcy. And so he must have heard about it because as it turns out, he ordered a whole fleet of cars to all of the priests within the city. I mean, when I read that, it was almost like jaw dropping because imagine all the priests within that town now suddenly had new cars. They were all paid for him and they were ordered from this dealership that was about to go bankrupt. So of course that ended up saving the dealership at that time. And in fact, there was another story that stood out Apparently, there was a church that was uh, an African-American church. They were having issues with their roof. They needed a new roof, but apparently they didn't have any money to help fix it. So he heard about it, and then later on, all of a sudden, they noticed that there was a crew there, and they were working on the church, and they were doing all this work to fix it, and it was free. No cost, no charge, and that's, again, from San Maceo. So you can see, again, why... He became so popular when it came to the, the public there. So, so where did it all go wrong, right? If you have a guy, again, who is so influential, not just with politicians and business leaders and the public and the celebrities and, in some cases, law enforcement in his pockets and so on, where did it all go wrong? Well, as it turns out, as I mentioned a minute ago, it all came almost crashing down with Nevada legalizing gambling back in 1931. Once that started, that was pretty much 
the end of things, like for his heir. You could almost see like the clock ticking down for it because, as we all know, there was a huge, heavy ramp up of casinos and gambling and entertainment and everything else, of course, that Nevada is associated with and Las Vegas is associated with now, but it also lured so many prominent mob figures. They went over there, including Bugsy Siegel and others. You know, they just saw that as an amazing startup, but they put all the focus on there. And then that's where slowly but surely his the, his popularity, whatever he had there in Galveston, this guy San Maceo, was slowly dwindling down. Like the, uh, the old, in this case, becomes new at a new location. And in his area, it was just going to be gone. Plus, by the late 1940s, it turns out that the corruption that was allowing him to prosper and then have these successful empires, it was slowly declining as well. People were doing the right thing. It seemed like when it came to politicians and law enforcement. So a lot of his activities began to get shut down. And as it turns out, San Maceo himself, the Velvet Glove, decided to go to Nevada. He ended up opening one of the most famous hotels that it's no longer there anymore, but it was very popular when it opened and is considered was considered one of the last remnants of the classic Las Vegas Strip. He opened up the desert in there, and so it seemed like he brought along some of his business partners in, over there, and he was able to get large projects funded, and so with that, he transferred a lot of the control over over there and then that's when it seemed like almost like the Galveston area was almost left as is so it didn't seem like he was putting too much more attention to it although I could have read it wrong somebody posts you know more comments on that whether it was truly something where he abandoned Galveston almost and then started moving towards the Las Vegas area and so eventually this guy San Maceo he ended up dying of of cancer in 1951 there at a John Hospin's hospital shortly after the Desert Inn was open. If you want a little bit of history too as far as the Desert Inn, next time you're at the Wynn, uh, the Wynn there in Las Vegas, when you're there, that's actually the former location of the Desert Inn. So imagine that again, next time you're walking down that location, realize that where you're walking was an area that this guy San Maceo helped build at that time. And then, of course, his, his casino and then his, his hotel is no longer there, but he at least helped to start it. And then it shows, again, that's one of the remnants from it, um, at least from his era. But Galveston, of course, and that huge boom that they had because of his dealings and everything else he had on the on the uh, illegal and legal side there was at least for that time period what was it roughly like 20 years maybe even up to 30 years there was that time period there that was known as Galveston's open era also known as the free state of Galveston and it was all thanks to this guy San Maceo again also known as the velvet glove but if anybody has any more information anything else I might have missed then please Please post those comments below um, if anybody maybe has more local info, especially there in the Galveston location, then and then please let me know. If you wanted to visit, for example, that Balinese room, which again became the it place there in Galveston, unfortunately, you're out of luck because as it turns out, I think it was Hurricane Ike, if I'm not mistaken, that's the hurricane that ended up demolishing that room afterward. It became a restaurant um, after, uh, after Sam died. Um, basically, most of his other businesses went with him. And so that Balinese room continued to operate as a restaurant, like a completely different restaurant. But then Hurricane Ike ended up demolishing it back in 2008. And so when that occurred, that was really one of the last parts there associated with San Maceo. And, and so it, that's pretty much it. It would have been fascinating, though, if that was still there to this day. It would have been great to be able to visit it and then see that type of history associated with the Velvet Glove. But again, any more information that someone has, please post those comments below. All right, everyone. Thanks again, as always. Take care.